So welcome everyone. Good to see you all. My name is Rosemina. I um, have been um, studying with Daryl for quite a few years uh, at TNI and um, also went through the recent mentorship uh, program with Daryl and others. And I've studied the Anapana Sati Sutta with Daryl for a couple of years before that. Um, and so it's my honor and my pleasure to be here today to, uh, to support um, Daryl as she uh, takes some time to, to heal and to recover from her surgery. Um, and throughout the session today, um, we will be talking about the Brahma Viharas. And so it's a nice opportunity too to, to share um, these blessings uh, with Daryl in her recovery and with everyone out there who uh, needs that kind of support um, as we all do. Um, so I'd like to begin um, with a brief land acknowledgement. And so um, just acknowledging um, my gratitude for um, my presence on this land and my intentions uh, what my intentions are for um, connecting and caring for um, the land and the stewards of this land. I am grateful to have this opportunity to reside um, on this territory. I'm in Toronto, also known as Toronto. Um, I'm a diasporic immigrant settler on this land, um, South Asian roots uh, coming through South Africa and uh, settling here in Canada for many, many years. So I call Canada my home. Um, and I acknowledge this sacred land, all of the, the gifts that I've received and that all of us have received, the, the resources um, that we have benefited from. Um, and we can think of land as, as planet Earth and um, our beloved planet that really needs our support and acknowledgement and anything that we can do um, to preserve this land. Um, it has been and continues to be the site of human activity, this area, for over 15,000 years. And Toronto, where I live and work, is the territory of the Huron Wendat. Patoon First Nations, the Seneca, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeki, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and the Wendaki Neon Wetsu. So my intentions are to support and care for this land and its peoples in whatever way I can, whether that's through raising awareness in the systems, in the um, institutions in the communities that I work in and live in, uh, fostering greater inclusion, connection through sharing, mutual caring, living peaceably on this land. Um, and also uh, to create uh, and contribute to safer um, and more inclusive spaces for people of all identities cultural backgrounds, um, life experiences, intersectionalities that, that we may bring. And so I invite you to reflect um, for yourself on what, uh, what your intentions might be, um, how you might, even in some small way, even through thoughts, um, small gestures, um, support this land and the stewards and the people residing on this land. Just taking a moment to silently contemplate that. And releasing this contemplation, perhaps um, taking it forward into the rest of the day or the week. Um, and I'd like to also share with you some chanting. Um, this is um, a favorite practice of mine. It's a really supportive practice. It connects me to my ancestral roots, uh, chanting, 
um, singing, reciting, are a big part of my tradition that I grew up in and my ancestral tradition, and also a big part of um, insight meditation and Vipassana and Theravada Buddhism, which is where these uh, this tradition, True North Insight, is rooted. Um, so I'm going to share my screen just so that you can see the words. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Thumbs up. Okay, thank you. So um, feel free to chant along um, where you are, uh, or you can read, follow along by reading the English translation. I'll be chanting the Pali. Um, and you can sit in any way that is supportive for your body that um, indicates uh, your um, connection to these, these words. Um, and also, um, before we begin the chanting, just reflecting on what we are about to do. Um, we're going to do the chant of the homage to the Buddha, um, the refuges, and the precepts. And so when we pay homage to the Buddha, what does that mean for you? Um, for many, uh, we think about the Buddha nature or what we aspire, the qualities that we aspire to cultivate in our lives. And taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. So we are a Sangha here, a small Sangha and the Sangha shifts and changes many shapes and configurations um, within True North Insight and, and in other insight meditation communities. Um, and in your communities that you live in. So how can we uh, practice together and relate to each other as a Sangha, taking these um, intentions to mind? Um, and what does it mean, uh, Dhamma? What does that mean? The teachings, um, the phenomena that we practice with on a daily basis in our formal practice and, and informally as we move about in our lives, um, the Buddha, the Buddha who uh, is the enlightened one, the awakened one, um, has taught us even just through his posture and through his teachings, um, the Satipatthana teachings that are so important in this tradition that Daryl has been sharing um, with us all um, so eloquently. Um, these are the teachings of the Buddha, you know, the foundational teachings of practice. And so what does this mean for you? And in taking the five precepts, um, the precepts for lay people in this tradition, um, non-harming, uh, not taking what is not given, um, behaving appropriately, in our relationships, um, not engaging in any misconduct, sexual or otherwise, um, refraining from false speech, wise speech, cultivating wise speech, and um, refraining from taking intoxicants which cause heedlessness. So these are aspirations. Um, they're not always hard and fast rules. Uh, for for many people, but they can be aspirations. And what do they mean to us? How do they show up in our lives? So this can be a contemplation that we do. This can support us. And I know for me, reciting the five precepts has really changed my life. It's informed my choices in ways that I didn't anticipate. Um, informally taking the five precepts as I've done um, it's been a real uh, source of support and guidance in my life that in a way that I didn't expect. So just, um, you know, in whatever way they speak to you, uh, being open to that. So we'll begin with the chanting. Um, 
and then I'll move into a brief talk and then we'll do some practice together. And um, whatever posture or mudra you wish to take, hands together, hands on the lap, one palm in the other, honoring the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. And taking refuge. Buddham saranam gachami. Dhammam saranam gachami. Sangam saranam gachami. Dutiyampi buddham saranam gachami. Dutiyampi dhammam saranam gachami. Dutiyampi sangam saranam gachami. Tatiyampi buddham saranam gachami. Tatiyampi dhammam saranam gachami. Tatiyampi sangam saranam gachami. And then chanting the precepts. Bana tipata veramani sikapadam samadhyami. Adina dana veramani sikapadam samadhyami. Kame sumi cha chara veramani sikapadam samadhyami. Musavada veramani sikapadam samadhyami. Sura media maja pamadatana veramani sikapadam samadhyami. Idam me silam maga fala nyanasa. Pachayo hotu sadu 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 anumodami. Thank you, everyone, for sharing this chanting together. I'd like to now uh, move into the main topic um, of today. Um, and this is the Brahma Viharas. So you may have um, practiced or studied or heard about the Brahma Viharas. And um, welcome to those of you just joining. We were just um, doing some chanting together. And uh, so there's minor delay in letting you in, but I'm, I'm happy that you're here. So as I said, we're, we're gonna engage in this topic of the Brahma Viharas. There'll be some opportunity for reflection as well as practice together. Um, so the Brahma Viharas, um, this is the Sanskrit or the, um, it's in Sanskrit and Pali. Um, they're also known as the sublime attitudes or the immeasurable abodes or openers of the heart, the Buddha's heart teachings. These connect us with our wishes for true happiness. Um, so reflecting on the meaning from the Pali language, Brahma Vihara. Brahma Vihara means dwelling place of the Brahmas, um, hence the word abode. Often they're called the abodes of the heart. Um, the Brahmas are known in Vedic traditions as gods who live in the heavens, resting in a sense of unlimited wholesomeness, fostering these immeasurable, uh, immeasurable abodes of goodwill 
uh, loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. Um, these are highly developed states of being. They're considered highly developed, sublime. Um, and they may be cultivated from our human expressions of them our expressions in our everyday lives, in our practice, in our relationships. And the more they are practiced, the more we live in accord with the values inspired by them, the more sublime the expression becomes. So again, it's an aspiration, it's a cultivation. And it's um, this cultivation is done over a, an extended period of time. So it takes time, it takes patience, it takes practice and awareness and intention setting. They're highly developed states of being. So um, this sublimation can happen with more and more practice. The Buddha established this framework for his teachings on how human beings can live wise, peaceful, and happy lives, and how they may free themselves from suffering. These four abodes are said to purify and transform the heart. Um, the immeasurables are also related uh, to human emotions. So in particular, in, uh, from, the, from the Pali language, metta, metta, you've heard of this term, friendship, goodwill, loving kindness. These are translations of metta. And this is the most fundamental, sort of the basic foundation. Um, the wish for true happiness. We can direct it towards ourselves or towards others. And this is also said to be the underlying motivation that led the Buddha to search for awakening and to teach this path to others. So it's an important one, metta. Karuna, karuna, compassion. This is an application of metta. It is the goodwill that one feels when encountering suffering, the capacity to understand that suffering, to see it, to acknowledge it, not to push it away, not to ignore it, not to deny it, and the wish to alleviate that suffering, to transform it, or if it is within our power, to help to prevent it or stop it. Mudita, sympathetic or empathetic or resonant joy. And this is another application of metta. It is the goodwill that one feels when encountering the happiness of others and wishing for that happiness to continue. And implicit in this is wishing for others not to be separated from their source of happiness, of true happiness. So this happiness goes beyond you know, our own joy, although our own joy can be a part of it. Um, it, it is a connecting kind of joy. It's a joy that we take in witnessing and appreciating the joy in others. And finally, upekka, upekka, equanimity. It's a little different than the others in the sense that um, it is also one of the seven factors of awakening. Um, it moderates and supports the other three abodes of the heart. It helps in maintaining a balance with the others. Um, a balance in views. It can help with setting appropriate boundaries. It can help us with practicing non-discrimination, non-duality. Um, it's this balancing force that kind of um, connects and mediates and supports all of the others, the loving kindness, the compassion, and the resonant joy. So for example, when we witness extreme suffering and we don't have the control, the power to stop it, we need equanimity to avoid that second arrow of additional suffering um, that may debilitate us or make us freeze. So equanimity um, avoids that second arrow 
and it helps us to be present enough and balanced enough within that suffering, within the witnessing of this extreme suffering, to see another path, to find another way that we may, you know, be able to help, even if we can't stop that suffering. So it's really important in that way. It provides us with space. It lets us channel our energy um, to where we may be able to help. So unlike what you know, many people think when they hear that word equanimity, um, it's not indifference. It's not being a robot, not feeling anything. Um, rather, it helps our goodwill, our loving kindness. It helps our metta to be more focused. It helps our compassion. It even helps our joy to be more focused, to be more effective, to be more balanced. And in this way, uh, equanimity is also very, very important in um, helping us to alleviate and prevent burnout. Equanimity, for example, combined with compassion, uh, with a foundation of mindfulness, this awareness of suffering. This is very powerful in avoiding burnout so that we may help others without losing ourselves. We may support others without depleting ourselves, even if it's in our thinking um, and also in action. So caregiving situations, um, how do we encounter the difficult realities of our modern world, of climate change, of political issues, of financial stress that so many are going through? political stress, how do we encounter these? We can, equanimity can really support us, support our compassion to give us another path. So a um, little bit of um, background on, on metta. Um, how did it come into Western mindfulness? You know, how did it kind of enter into our modern day practice um, in the West? So Buddha Gosa is a Buddhist monk from the fifth century um, of the common era. And uh, he expanded upon the original uh, discourse of the Buddha um, in a text called the Vasudhi Maga, the path of purification. He first uh, emphasized the significance of loving kindness for the self. And um, he said, First of all, it should be developed only towards oneself, doing it repeatedly thus. May I be happy and free from suffering, or may I keep myself free from enmity, affliction, and anxiety, and live happily. And these teachings of Buddha Gosa were adapted later by um, well-known teachers such as Sharon Salzberg, who wrote about this, taught it. It's it's kind of her, she's known for this as her primary practice. Um, and also subsequent to this, uh, adaptations were included even in secular mindfulness practices or secular mindfulness programs like MBSR, for example. Um, and um, we all have the capacity to feel within us and to express these four attitudes, to live within these four abodes. Um, but reaching this immeasurable state takes wise effort and practice. So for example, um, it's easy to feel compassion or metta for someone we love or care about, someone we like. It's not so easy to feel it for those we don't like, don't agree with maybe those who don't subscribe to our politics or our values. And so, um, and equanimity is also challenging when those we love are suffering. We can get lost in that suffering, in that wish to help, in that wish to take that suffering away. Um, and so they take practice. You know, these uh, abodes, these immeasurable, they, they take practice. And in order to fully develop these capacities, we need to cultivate them. 
Um, we need to practice discernment when we're cultivating them. Um, awareness and understanding. So mindfulness as a foundation as well. Um, being aware of not bypassing or ignoring our struggles or the struggles of others, but um, holding space to be with the difficult because it can be very difficult. When we seek love, uh, when we search for love in our lives, we may encounter the opposite, all the examples of when we didn't experience love or compassion. Uh, we may not notice all the things that are kind of wrong with the world. And so this is where we can bring the head and the heart together. This is where the heart to mind can connect with this experience of being with, sitting with, with equanimity, with presence, with mindfulness, and with kindness and understanding for our own suffering, for our own difficulty. And that's okay. That's okay to be there and to uh, recognize it. And um, from a neuroscience perspective, uh, if any of you are interested in this, um, it's also, it can be connected to the window of tolerance, to this idea that in the midst of suffering, we can get overwhelmed. Our nervous system may get activated. We might um, flip our lid, so to speak. Um, so our reptil reptilian brain takes over. So we, we react. Our nervous system gets activated. We go into fight, flight, or freeze. Um, when we pair equanimity with mindfulness, we can regulate our emotions. We can bring that prefrontal cortex back online, the reasoning aspect of our brains. And we can come out of fight, flight, or freeze and be more balanced in the midst of that suffering. Um, and so we can come back into our capacity, our zone of capacity where we can learn new things, where we can um, act reasonably, um, where we can support ourselves and others without being overwhelmed. So the Buddha taught the Brahma Viharas in the context of mindfulness and reflective awareness. Um, and Kama, Pali Kama, or the Sanskrit Karma, cause and effect. Um, we also need to understand this, especially for equanimity. So this is, um, there's a process of how emotions can manifest in the body and the mind. And this is kind of linked to, to that um, discourse of the Satipatthanas. You know, what are these dhammas? What are these phenomena that we encounter in our everyday lives, in our practice? Um, understanding why we are developing these attitudes, these abodes of the heart, understanding how the negative effects can develop in the body and mind if we don't know how to manage these and balance them. This helps us to know how we can take care of our hearts and how we can cultivate the heart into a place where the Brahma Viharas can dwell, where we can connect with these energies. And so understanding what we are doing with mindful awareness, stepping out of our kind of automatic pilot way of doing things, of being, uh, this being versus doing in our lives, being versus problem solving all the time, busyness all the time, and knowing how our stressors um, affect us, knowing how the repercussions of our actions and our experiences affect our minds and our hearts and our bodies. So cultivating this awareness through practice, our thinking, our emotions, the feeling tone. We talk about these four satipatthanas, the body, sensations in the body, various contemplations of the body, our impulses, even our behaviors. <clears throat> these um, motivate us and prepare us for the cultivation of these sublime states. So just considering that for a moment, this connection between the Satipatthana and the Brahma Vihara. 
<clears throat> the Buddha um, is often quoted from the Dhammapada, speak or act with an impure mind and trouble will follow you as the wheel follows the ox that draws the cart. Speak or act with a pure mind and happiness will follow you as your shadow unshakable. So what is an impure mind? This could be interpreted as unskillful or unwholesome. So it's not meant as a judgment to say you're a bad person if you've thought um, negative thoughts about someone. Um, that's not what this is saying. It's just an awareness of how do um, our thoughts and our emotions and our feeling tones and how we experience them in the body how do these affect us? How do these affect us? And how do they affect our relationships? So it's more for understanding, you know, understanding and knowing um, the effect, knowing the cause of, of what is going on um, in our lives. We are the architects of our own lives, our happiness and our suffering, each person. That doesn't mean we're responsible necessarily for the, um, for the atrocities that happen uh, to us or uh, to others, but um, there are ways to cultivate our awareness and there are ways to help each other and to help ourselves. Deep down, we all have the wish to be happy, and yet we all seem to get in our own way. Often we get in our own way, we self-sabotage, we hide, we run. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this, maybe. Um, and also we can, um, we have moments of joy and peace and goodwill and presence and love. So we are capable of so much. And this is not again to judge us because this is our human condition. We've been conditioned to, to to show up in particular ways or to feel in particular ways. And so we're just on this path you know, to develop more understanding of ourselves, of humanity, of each other. Um, you know, we might sometimes feel worried or insecure or confused, not sure where to go, not sure what to do. Maybe this is where the Sangha can come in. Maybe this is where um, Dhamma friends can come in. Uh, the teachings can come in, the Dhamma, you know, the Buddha, uh, keeping that Buddha nature, the, the teachings of the Buddha in our hearts and minds. We're human and we make mistakes and we're affected by the things that happen to us. And we also have the capacity for immeasurable goodwill, for compassion, for joy, for equanimity. So what arises when uh, we think of ourselves in this way? Uh, compassion, perhaps, for being human, for the suffering we go through as human beings, for the trials and the tribulations, even if they are in our minds. And Mark Twain um, is often quoted, uh, in, and I'm paraphrasing here, but all I've, I've suffered so many troubles in my mind, and they've all but there, I've suffered so many troubles in my life and they've been imagined, they've been in my mind. So I gave away the punchline, but just to say that we imagine so much and that affects our hearts and our minds. And so um, compassion for this human state, this human nature, uh, rejoicing in the happiness of others. When have you heard someone say they're grateful for something or they've received some good news, even if it's a perfect stranger, and you feel this spark of joy, this happiness for them? So this is in our capacity as well, this happiness for our fellow humans, for even when we hear good things about the planet, um, stories about the resiliency and the survival of, of um, the animal kingdom um, and nature. Um, and equanimity, bringing all of this together in this kind of a balanced way. Um, a balance between the extremes. And our human nature is 
We want more good things to happen to us. We want to avoid or ignore the bad things. We love pleasure over pain. Um, all of these vicissitudes, you know, gain, fame, wealth, material things, sensual pleasures. Yeah, we have a weakness for these things as human beings. Um, but we also uh, want to be compassionate and we also want to be kind and we're also um, cap cap capable of love. We're attached to the people and things we love. We want them to last forever. And we're capable of following this path and practicing and recognizing that there is impermanence and there is no fixed self. From the Metta Sutta, in the Buddha's um, kind of most famous example of how to express an attitude of unlimited goodwill, he doesn't just express um, this as a wish for universal happiness. He says, um, happy at rest, may all beings be happy at heart. Whatever beings there may be, weak or strong, without exception, long, large, middling, short, subtle, blatant, seen or unseen, near and far, born and seeking birth, may all beings be happy at heart. And then he adds this wish that all beings avoid causes that would lead them to unhappiness. He says, let no one deceive another or despise anyone anywhere through anger, irritation, wishing another to suffer. So in the metta practice, for example, we can visualize um, or we can visualize, say, the metta from the mountain, from the sun, from the earth, or we can practice with words. We're not just talking about conventional happiness, material happiness. Um, we may visualize people acting skillfully with less hatred, with less ill will, with kindness, um, even those we don't like. Maybe there's a politician, you know, that you don't like, and we can visualize the person acting more skillfully, being more kind, being more aware, um, visualize them changing their ways. And then compassion can make those, um, compassion and action through compassion can make those visualizations a reality, perhaps. So we might explore what are the unskillful actions that lead to suffering? when we think of compassion? And can we have compassion for those who are guided by unskillful actions? Can we have compassion for ourselves when we make a mistake? When we forget something, when we harm another? Even in some small way, we're so hard on ourselves all the time. So feeling joy, not for those just who are already happy, but those who might be acting skillfully for future happiness, encouraging those people as well. And rather than getting upset about something we can't change, can we practice equanimity and spaciousness to see um, through to a way that we might be able to help in some small way or simple way, we can have a profound effect still by listening, simply listening, being an ally, offering allyship, offering support, not taking care of or fixing anyone. So we can think about how do we treat ourselves? How do we treat others? How are we treated by others? How can we contribute positively or negatively to our own happiness or to others' happiness? These effects show up in the body, in the mind, in our speech, including our internal speech and our feelings. So our emotions are made up of thoughts and perceptions, and this shows up in the body. It shows up in the breath. So can we pay attention to the feeling tone, the feeling tone, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, as a precursor and to be aware of our thoughts? to be discerning about our perceptions. 
So the Buddha provides a skillful alternative to reacting to discomfort. And we can use these tools and the mindfulness practices such as those that we take from the Satipatthana that has been shared with you already. So awareness of the breath, awareness of our body, calming, soothing the body, preparing ourselves to be present, to be open, um, awareness of our thoughts, emotions, our feeling tones, the dhammas, sensory experiences, worldly experiences, the phenomena we may witness. So breathing through discomfort, allowing it to dissolve can be part of the practice. Letting breath create physical feelings of ease and fullness, allowing those feelings to saturate your whole body. Physical ease, putting the mind at ease as well. And when we're operating from a sense of ease, it's easier to fabricate skillful perceptions as we evaluate our responses to whatever we're facing. Noticing residue from unskillful actions or conversations. Um, how does this affect our sleep? How does this affect our digestion? Our ability to focus in meditation? You now, all of this can be awarenesses that we cultivate in um, in our practice, in our everyday lives, ways of bringing in the Brahma Viharas and living in these abodes, living with them. Equanimity, mindfulness, these are also enlightenment factors accompanied by loving kindness. The Buddha says in the Metam Sutta, he says, um, and how monks does a monk cultivate hearts release by loving kindness. What is its goal, its excellence, its fruit and its outcome? In this case, monks, a monk cultivates the enlightenment factor of mindfulness accompanied by loving kindness. And similarly, the enlightenment factors of investigation of states, energy, rapture, tranquility, concentration, equanimity, accompanied by loving kindness, which is based on detachment, dispassion, leading to maturity of surrender. If he wishes to dwell, perceiving the repulsive in what is not repulsive, he dwells thus, perceiving the repulsive. If he wishes to dwell, the perceiving unrepulsive in what is repulsive, he dwells thus, perceiving the unrepulsive. And he continues on um, perceiving repulsive both in what is repulsive and not repulsive. Um, to dwell equanimous. If he wishes to avoid both repulsive and unrepulsive, to dwell equanimous, mindfully and clearly aware, he dwells thus equanimous. Mindful and clearly aware, attaining the heart's release called beautiful, he abides there. He abides in the beautiful. This release from passion, from attachment, this leading to concentration. So um, I just say one more thing and then we'll move into a practice. The Brahma Viharas also lead to states of concentration, the jhanas. They are concentration practices as well as purification practices. And simply by practicing the Brahma Viharas, we can um, develop our concentrated mind. So um, let's, uh, let's practice together. Finding a comfortable posture that is supportive for your body. Allowing yourself any of these postures as the Metta Sutta says, when standing, walking, sitting, or lying down. Whenever he feels tiredness, let him or her or they establish well this mindfulness. This it is said, 
is the divine abode. Any of these postures. And the Burma Viharas of non exclusive, impartial, not bound by selective preferences or prejudices. And so taking some time here to settle into your posture. Just beginning by observing what's here, observing the breath, the breath as it's coming and going. Observing whatever experience is here in the moment. Any thoughts that are here, emotions, sensations in the body. Truly experiencing in each moment without and pushing it away, creating space for whatever is here, and bringing in the sense of curiosity, interest, being with. And beginning to practice with the abode of the heart, with the immeasurable. And with each inhale, breathing in a sense of loving kindness towards ourselves beginning with the self. There might be words of kindness, maybe what we wish for, needs we may have for Support, understanding, love. There might be an image of kindness. A felt sense. May I be safe. May I be happy. May I live with ease. Any other wishes? Of loving kindness towards ourselves. Inviting in now compassion 
May I be free from suffering. May I be at peace. May I be able to care for myself as I care for others. Maybe a felt sense of cultivating compassion for our own suffering. For our vicarious stress and suffering. and enjoy. May I be able to savor these moments of joy that I may experience, perhaps in witnessing the joy of others. May I savor happiness. May this joy continue. May I not be separated, parted from joy. And the joy in connection with others. May I live with abundance. May I feel there is enough. I am enough. And may equanimity be a balancing force. May the energy of equanimity support me as I dwell in these abodes of loving kindness, of compassion, and of joy. May I recognize that I may care for others, yet I may not be able to take away their pain. May I trust in kamma. that these experiences are maybe opportunities for learning, and yet I may try to help if I can. Even if I didn't directly cause this, I may try to help in some way. May I live with equanimity in honoring in appreciating the effects of thoughts, of emotions, of behaviors in my life. May this help me to regulate myself in moments where this would be helpful. continuing for a few moments to
cultivate in a felt sense with words, with an image in our mind of these abodes of the heart, cultivating them in our own lives. And with each in-breath, breathing in a sense of loving kindness, of compassion, of joy, of equanimity. perhaps drawing from the vastness of compassion and loving kindness and joy and balance, equanimity that is present in the world. This ocean. And then with each exhale, now offering these energies, these intentions, these blessings to others in the world. Sharing these with loved ones. And expanding this offering to even those you don't know. Those you know, those you don't know. Maybe those you don't agree with or get along with or like the difficult beings, the neutral beings all beings, animal beings, mountain beings, plant beings, earth beings. Offering these wishes of loving kindness. With each exhale, an image, a felt sense, some words. May you be happy. May you be safe and well. And may you live with ease. And offering compassion, may you be free from suffering. May you be at peace. May you live with awareness and acceptance of yourself in your power, your ability. And 
May you receive the help that you need. Offering joy. May you savor your happiness. May you not be parted from your happiness. May your joy continue. May you plant wholesome seeds. Perhaps may we plant them together. And inviting in this energy of equanimity. May you have the ability to care for yourself. May you be aware of the sources of your happiness and unhappiness. The impact of actions. of support, aware of support that is present, allyship, friendship. The power to set boundaries. The power of community. And wishes to alleviate the suffering of others and the recognition that we may take some small step even if we can't change what's happening. Continuing to breathe in these energies of the abodes, the immeasurables of the heart. Breathing in compassion, loving kindness, joy, equanimity. Planting these seeds for our own lives. And with each out breath, offering these into the world. Helping to cultivate these seeds.
the last few moments of this practice, just dropping in some reflections of um, equanimity, some phrases of equanimity for ourselves as we navigate the challenges of life. May I be the nature of flexibility as I meet the comings and goings of my life. Joy and sorrow are a natural part of the human condition. May I be open and able to receive with clarity of heart, mind, and meet the conditions of my life as they are. May I gain confidence that True equality is present all the days of my life. And letting in these qualities of flexibility, openness, confidence on each inhale and feeling them permeating my whole being on the exhale. Letting them in in any way that is possible with each breath through the feet, through the earth, or through an energy in the crown of the head moving through the entire body. Noticing where they may reside, flexibility, equality, openness, confidence. Now bringing the attention back to the body in this posture, the body breathing, supported. The sense of the space around you. The feeling of temperature. Sounds. awareness of being here in this room in the sangha together whenever you're ready feeling free to open the eyes if they're closed it's bringing the attention back and taking a little stretch if you need one um, twist a deep breath with a sigh. Thank you all for engaging in this practice. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now and we'll have some time for sharing um, together in small groups.